Hello and happy Tuesday. Hope you're all doing well. Let me just turn the music down a little bit. How are you all doing? I want to thank you to everyone that has joined for this live stream. I really appreciate it. Uh, shout out to Team LBT. How are you doing? Thank you very, very much for joining. It is appreciated. So uh, we did a uh, vault brown bag session last week uh, where we went through the community forum and asked three questions. It seemed quite popular, so I thought I'd follow it up this week. Um, and we're more than likely going to take it to be a weekly stream. Uh, thank you very much for the follow, Anton. Uh, thanks for joining. How are you doing? Anyone that doesn't know Anton, um, Anton does great work in the open source space with uh, a lot of Terraform modules and a lot of AWS interactions. So definitely give Anton a follow. Um, I think he does a, a weekly dose of Terraform live stream as well, which is very good. I definitely tune in for that uh, as often as I can. So definitely follow Anton Babenko. Uh, great lad, great lad. Anyway, we're going to get started. Um, so we've got a few questions from the community forum, um, which I've kind of picked to, to go through them. Uh, and the first one is about how to do the database credentials um, using the Vault database secrets engine. So we'll just bring it up here on screen. Let me just share my screen so you can see. Uh, give me a sec. Uh, let me just share screen. Amazing. So you should be able to see my screen now. Make my voice louder. Okay. Give me a second. How about now? Is that better, Anton? Hopefully it is. Let me know if you're having any issues with the audio. I appreciate the feedback. Right, okay, so we have a question, thank you. So we have a question here, uh, which we'll go through. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, please delete this thread, it's no longer needed. Okay, well, no worries. I'll um, just quickly go through the question anyway, seeing as it's here. Uh, so the question is, how could we use dynamic secrets with a connection string to access a SQL database. I read that the database secret backend role can create a database secret backend role in Vault and it can be used to generate dynamic credentials for the database. And then this bit here, it looks like it's uh, a piece of Terraform that they've done. Okay, so they say they don't really need to answer this question, but you know, I've already kind of gone down this rabbit hole and, and come up with an answer. So let's um let's start from the very beginning um in order to um create a secrets backend role you need to enable the vault uh, uh database secrets engine um so let me actually just switch to my terminal um, i have some code i've written that we can do this with right um, so we need to i hope that's legible let me just make this a bit bigger just in case you all cannot see it very clearly. I hope that's cool. Yeah, so the, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is um, you're gonna want to enable the um, the database secrets engine. Now there's a few ways you can do this. You, you can do it with the command line, which is what I'll go through now. Uh, you can also do it with Terraform as well, which I'll point you to a Terraform module that I've written that allows you to do this as well. And more recently in Vault 1.7, you can do this in the web UI. Uh, however, the uh, web UI is a little bit limited because they've only just brought this feature out. I think you can only do, it's either, I think it might be MongoDB is the only database that you can use in the web UI. But I believe that support is gonna be rolled out for more of these database secrets engines. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just create um, the, well, we'll enable the secrets engine, right? So if I just run that, ah, 
I know what I've forgotten to do. I need to set my uh, environment variable. Um, so this is that error message you just saw there is by default. Um, the CLI will try to connect over HTTPS. Obviously, I'm just using a local development environment, which is on HTTP. Um, so you get an error there. So if I set this environment variable, I should be good to go. So I'm probably gonna have to log in as well. We'll just do that. And we're logged in, right? So, you know, normally I wouldn't do this on live stream, but this is a local development environment, which is just on my machine. So no one's gonna be able to access it. And you know, it's getting torn down after the live stream. So we're logged in now. So what we want to do is we want to enable this secrets engine, right? So secrets engine is enabled. Now, next we want to do is we want to configure a connection to the database, right? So Vault needs to know how to talk to a database, where to go, what the credentials are to log in to that database, right? Now, the way that Vault is going to work is you, you actually have, hey Adil, thanks for joining. Hope you're good. The way it's going to work with Vault is um, Vault has the ability to rotate this password, right? So it's probably not a good idea to give it your um, your main super user password because once it rotates it, only Vault will know what it is and there's no way of you reading that secret out. So the best thing to do is to create a... Um, you want, you want to create a super user specifically for Vault to use to be able to connect. And it has to be a super user because it's going to need the permissions to be able to create, update, and delete database users on your behalf, right? So um, that's the thing. You're basically delegating trust to Vault. So uh, let me just quickly copy because I'm not very good with SQL. So I've kind of written this out up front. This is a SQL statement we're going to need. And let me just uh, go back this way. And I have PG admin. Let me just add my server here. And we'll just call this local host. And the connection is going to be local host. And that port is okay. The password, I'm just using the default password for, it's just a Postgres container that I have on my machine. Please don't do stuff like this on live streams if it's your production uh, environments. This is literally for demo purposes. Uh, so that should, yep, there you go. And obviously we're getting a warning about the password because I'm just using default password. So what I'm gonna want to do, I think, oh no, it's not that one, is it this one here? Query tool. So in here, I'm gonna wanna run that SQL statement. So if I just paste that. So what we're doing is we're creating a user called Vault Admin. Uh, which is cool. And we're just giving it this password, password string. So if I run that, you can see that it comes up successful. Uh, let me just zoom this screen just so you can see it a bit more. I'm not sure if you saw the SQL statement. So we're basically just creating a role, right? And it's just quite similar to creating a user. We're giving it this uh, super user permission and we're just assigning this password to it. So this is what we're gonna use to configure Vault for the database secrets engine, right? Uh, so if I go back here and we have a look at this command here. So this is how we're gonna configure the database secrets engine. So we're gonna write a database config uh, and we're gonna call this config DevOps Rob dash DV, DB, sorry, we're getting my Bs and Vs mixed up. Uh, and the plugin that we want to use is the Postgres uh, database plugin, right? So if we were using, um, I don't know, MySQL, then we would use the MySQL database plugin or whatever it's called, right? Uh, but in this case, it's Postgres that we want to use. And what we're saying for this database connection, that the only roles that are going to be allowed to create credentials against this connection is a role called DevOps Rob, right? We'll get to what we mean by that in just a moment. Now, some of the things I want to point out here is this connection URL. The, the way that we're doing it is in a templated fashion. Uh, thank you very much for the follow, uh, Grateful Cafe. Much appreciated. So what we're doing is this is, you know, just like any other uh, Postgres uh, connection string, 
it's quite similar. But what we're doing with the username and a password is we're templating that, right? And the reason why we're templating that is because eventually we're going to be able to rotate this username and password. And when we rotate it, Vault is going to have to know still how to connect to that. So by having a templated approach, it can kind of read that credential from itself and then still be able to configure and use the database secrets engine. So it's just a templating that we've got here for the username and the password, right? And I'm just using a tool called Shipyard to run my container. And obviously because it's a demo, I'm not running it uh, in SSL mode. So I've disabled that. And I'm just passing in my initial username and password. So if I just copy and paste this code into my terminal, I'll just clear the terminal so it's a bit less confusing. And hopefully this works. And I think it works because I didn't get any error messages, right? Uh, but I didn't see the word success, so it's a bit weird. Let's just have a quick look and make sure that I did this right. Connection. Yeah, looks all good. So I think that's I think that's worked. Um, so let's just clear that again. So. Now we've done that, we can create a role, right? So let's talk about the role a little bit. Now, in terms of the role, this is, you can think about the role in Vault as kind of a mapping between what a, a role may be on the database. So in this role, we could have a role called uh, read only, for example. Um, I've just called it DevOps Rob, just for naming sake. But if we had a role called read only, we create this role and what we're doing is we're telling Vault what the SQL statement to run is, right? So we're running this SQL statement and, you know, if we needed to ass assign any specific permissions to any specific tables, we can add it all in here. Now, I've just taken a generic statement here and just granted select on all tables, uh, but you can be as granular as you want. So whatever the role is that you require people to be able to do things for, you just create a SQL statement that's um, correct for that. So normally, if you're not a SQL DBA, um, you would normally get some kind of uh, DBA within your organization to help you write these statements, unless obviously you know what you're doing, which clearly it's not really my area of strength. So that's the key thing. We're basically creating this role and we are using this database, uh, this database connection, which we configured a little bit earlier on. This is the creation statements. Anytime we want to create a credential, this is how we're going to use it. And we're giving it a default TTL one hour. So what will happen is after one hour, it will go into the database and it will uh, revoke the credential that is created, right? And the maximum uh, time to live that we can have on that is 24 hours. So we'll run this and hopefully we don't get any errors because I'm still a bit nervous about the last command if it worked or not. Um, and that looks all good. So let's try reading a credential. So I think it's going to be something like vault read uh, database because that's the secrets engine and it's creds. And the role that we've just created is called DevOps Rob. And hopefully it should give us some credentials. And it does. So that's amazing. So you can look here, it's given us this credential with this username here. And this is the password that it is created there. And it's telling us that this lease is for one hour. So it will go ahead and it will revoke that lease after an hour. Um, so now what you're going to have is a situation where secrets are not sprawled all over. Like, so if you create a user for a specific use case and then you don't need it anymore, for example, you then don't have the, uh, the cleanup operation of having to go in and removing redundant credentials and trying to figure out what credentials are still in use and which ones are still actively being used by other applications. So that's kind of the basis of it. Now, just to kind of show you what I meant about the templating, we can actually rotate the uh, password, right? So we've given it a password, which we created called uh, Vault Admin. And I can't for the life of me actually remember what the command is. So I'm actually gonna Google it. Um, so let's just do vault, uh, uh, let's do database, 
credential rotate and see what comes up because I can't I can't remember what the command is. Um, so root credential rotation. We've got a learn guide here, and this is the command here, right? So okay, cool. Amazing. So let's oh, let's power show that. Let's just clear this. And I think it's a write command. Uh, so it'll be vault write. And the path is database. Uh, what was the, what was the path again? Rotate root and then the name. Okay, so it would be rotate, oops, can't spell. Rotate dash root forward slash the name and the name of it was uh ba, 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 ba. record it devops rob db so oh do i have to use a force i didn't know that let me just double check that because it's been a while since i've done this but i'm pretty sure uh if we just go in here is this the one Nah. Actually, I think the best place to go might be the actual Postgres documentation. Oh, no, it is. So you do need to run a force on it. Okay, cool. So you've got an example here. A while since I've done this, as you can tell. Oh, have I done that room? Vault right dash force. What did I do? Oh, okay. I did it in the wrong place. I apologize. I'm proving that we're still only human. Okay, so that should work. And it's rewritten to that. So we've rotated the credentials. So now the next thing we can do is we can check to see if, thank you, um, Adil. I, I didn't even see your message there. But yeah, you kind of give me the answer in the chat. Thank you. Um, so now we've rotated the credential. Because we've templated it, Vault should still be able to generate new credentials because remember, it still needs to be able to connect to the database to be able to make the API calls to create and revoke the credentials. So now we've rotated it. If there is a problem and we try to generate a credential, it's not gonna be able to connect to the database. So we'll get an error message, right? So if we just run this command again and see if it generates some credentials, that'd be a good test, I think. And it still generates credentials. So that's the basis of how the uh, the database secrets engine works in Vault. So I mentioned that uh, you could you can configure it with the CLI as we've just done, um, and you obviously can read creds from the CLI. You can also use the API as well. I also mentioned that you could use the web UI, though that is limited to. Is it MongoDB? Let's just have a look. Um, If I go to the database, six engine, go to connection, let's uh, create a new connection, database plug. Yeah, it's, it's MongoDB. It's the only one that it supports at the moment. So I guess as time goes on, we'll be supporting all of the database, um, uh, all of the databases that the database secrets engine does support. Um, and you'll be able to configure your connection from within the UI. But at the moment, you cannot do that. Um, the other way you can do it is with Terraform. Um, I do have a Terraform uh, module that I've written. Um, I'll have to do a Google search. Uh, so Terraform, uh, let's see if it comes up. Ah, okay, cool. Thank you, uh, Adil, I appreciate it. Well, I'm gonna click on that link that you just sent in a second, Adil. Um, okay, so. We have, these are some of the modules that I've written. Um, most of my modules are related to security or vault specifically. And we should have a database one. I thought we had a database one, which is odd. Oh, that's odd. I thought we had a database one. I'm pretty sure, unless I'm missing it. Console, AWS, GCP. That is very, very odd. 
I'll look it up because I've definitely got the code on my machine. But let's just check this link that Adil has sent. Let's see what he has. Ah, okay, cool. So if you do want to do it with Terraform and you're not using my module, which I'll find a link and I'll send it to you because I'm just weird that it's not coming up. Uh, this is uh, the resource you can use to configure the database connection. So we talked about um, passing in uh, the uh, the URL for your your uh, database and also talked about passing in the username and password. So this would be how you configure that for it. There's some other resources. Thank you so much, Adil. I should just make you a moderator because you're just being so helpful right now. Um, it's another resource. And this is the role. So we talked about how to create the role. So you can do all of this uh, with the database uh, secrets engine as well. Hey, Adil, correct me if I'm wrong, but have you written any modules as well for the database secrets engine? I know you've been doing a lot of module writing of late. And I know I've got a module, but I can't for the life of me find it on the registry, which is odd. Um, oh, you're working on it. Nice, nice, nice. We should uh, compare notes because, um, like I said, I've definitely got a module and I could have sworn I published it. Um, so I'm a little bit disappointed that I can't see it. Well, maybe I didn't. But it's actually baked into this here. But, you know, I'm going to retire this one here. And you can, you know, let me just see if I've got examples. Uh, where's the examples? Uh, ah, okay, so I've got an example here. Um, and you can't actually see the code here, but I, I have all examples within here. So you could use this module if you want, but I am going to retire this module in favor of something a bit more specific for the database uh, secrets engine rather than a secrets engine module as a whole. Um, so yeah, watch this space. Uh, Okay, so we grateful cafe. There are also some pretty spiffy libraries for a number of languages that you can leverage to pull credentials natively into your app. Vault agent, console template are also your friends. If you don't want to, you can mod you, you don't need to modify your app. Exactly. Um, so you can do that directly from the API if you want. Um, so I, I showed it last week. I'll show it again just for anyone that wasn't here. If you come into your UI and you just type in API, that's a bug, but it doesn't really matter. You get this API Explorer. So if you wanna know how to use the API for something specific, you can literally just search it in there and it lets you, you know, if I just click on this, you can actually try out the commands and it tells you what the payloads are and so on and so forth, right? So if you wanna use the API natively, you can. Um, there are client libraries as well. So the official supported library is the uh, Go one. Let me actually look up the libraries. So if I do vault client libraries. Yes, um, very, very good point. So what Adil was saying in the chat for anyone that's not looking at the chat at the moment, he's saying one of the challenges of using Terraform to create SQL connection is the passing of plain text root password. Uh, the mitigation would be to use something like AWS Lambda triggered vault audit on successful creation of a SQL connection and then it hits the rotate endpoint. So that's nice. So it's like the moment you do it, then it will rotate, which is, you know, kind of limiting your blast radius quite a bit. I really like that approach but it is true it's uh when you think about this what we're talking about is secret zero again it's a it's a very common problem so in terms of your database that's your database is secret zero and you need a way to get it to your trusted system in this case it's going to be vault um and you need to do that securely um i know people will use things like environment variables so i think even in my code uh, for my terraform module i'm using environment variables uh and you know, that's better than putting it in plain text in your code, but it's not still not great. Like if we're being honest, it's still very readable by anyone who has access to those environment variables. And there's no way to really control and govern who can uh, have access to that credential. So it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, but yeah, if, if you do prefer to use Terraform, uh, that's one of the things that you've got to look forward to is how are you going to get that credential into um, Terraform. But here we have uh, a page here uh, about the client libraries. Let me just zoom it so that you can see a bit more legibly. 
hopefully that's good. So the official uh, client library that we have is the the Go client library, which is no surprise because at HashiCorp we use Go to build um, most, I'd say most of our um, most of our tools. And the other one is Ruby. Um, and I think that maybe came from uh, the first product that we um, we had at HashiCorp was a Vagrant, and I believe Vagrant is written in Ruby. I stand to be corrected. Um, so that's probably the reason why those two are the officially supported ones. But that aside, if um, if you are happy to use community supported libraries, we have, there's one for Ansible, which I've actually used in a demo in the past. Um, it's just built off the back of Python, pretty much, just like building any other uh, Ansible um, module. Uh, we have a couple for C Sharp. So we have Vault Sharp and we have Vault.net. Uh, so these can be quite useful. And we also have another one for C++. I didn't even realize we have one for Clojure. Um, same here for, for this one here. I didn't even realize we even had all of these things. So it's great to see that the community has just kind of expanded our API and just built client libraries that work for all these different languages. You have Erlang. Looks like someone's written their own version of the Go one, which is cool. We also have Haskell, um, Java is a good one. Um, actually look out, talking of Java, look out, I have a talk coming up at the Kafka Summit, which I think is May the 11th to May the 12th. I'll have to double check those dates, but I'm giving a talk about how to secure your Kafka messages at rest using Vault. Uh, and that includes the Transit Secrets Engine as well as the transform secrets engine if you want to do things like format preserving encryption so definitely check that out obviously i know that um kafka is hugely adopted by the java community which is why i bring that up but yeah uh there's a bunch of libraries here which are community supported so you have kotlin node.js php uh powershell even you know we had some questions actually last week around um how to um get secret zero into a PowerShell script. So this will kind of explain um, why that person was asking that. They're obviously using uh, this client library here. And HVAC is probably the library that I've used the most. Um, so I used to use it a, a couple of years back when I was doing quite a bit of Python work. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty good library. And I think since I've last used it, a lot of things have been expanded inside there. So there's a lot of things now that you can do that you weren't able to do before, which is great. And actually, I think if you're using the Ansible um, library, it's using HVAC in the background to to do all these things here. There you go. HVAC is solid. Yeah, honestly, like I, I, it's the only library I can really speak on because it's the only one I've used quite extensively over the years. And, um, you know, I, I've never had any problems. Um, I think the only reason why I ended up st stopping using it is because I was speaking to so many engineers that were um, doing things in different languages. Uh, when I'm telling them about uh, HVAC, you know, they, they just don't understand like how to use it or whatever it is, and they can't translate it into their native languages. So I figured that the universal language would be the API directly. Um, so yeah, I don't even use the Go SDK anymore. I just native API, which kind of works for me just because I speak to so many different people. But back in the day, I was working in um, mainly Python shops. So um, it was cool, you know, you could, you could use HVAC and everyone could understand it. It was very transferable knowledge. We also have R, Rust and Scala, which I only know one engineer that writes Scala. So yeah, there's there's a bunch of different libraries that are community supported out there. And if you find that you're using any of these libraries and you like it, um, it's definitely worth a punt of getting involved in their open source communities to help out with that. But yeah, that's kind of the first question kind of answered. I know we veered off a little bit into some um, some of the other kind of subject areas like client libraries, but um, let's have a quick look at some of the other questions that I have here. Um, so I've got a few more. So let's check this one out. Um, let's just share my screen again. Again, I'm gonna zoom this in because it looks a bit small. I'm trying to have mercy on your eyesight, people. Um, so forgive me as I'm still very new to administering Vault, but I set up a service account and minted a token against that service account using the following commands. So let's see what they're trying to do. So they are doing the same thing I did just to write their Vault address to an environment variable. They're logging in. 
with LDAP, fine. So this is the core of what they're trying to do. They're creating a token with this policy and it's got a max explicit max TTL of, I think that equates to a year maybe. I think that's a year and they've set the TTL for a year and they've just put a display there. So the problem is my token is then minted without issue and show something like this. So that's fine. So it looks like it's created it. So any ideas why the token dies? I find it very hard to determine this information based on the logs. So I think this person's problem is going to be around inheritance, right? So they are logging in using this LDAP method, whatever this service account is. Now, I'm not sure what policies and what kind of TTLs are associated with this service account, but I'll bet that it's less than this one year or whatever this equates to, right? So it's going to inherit that. So the way to get around that is, let's just take, let's take this whole command and dump it into my terminal. Uh, let's just clear this. Actually just full screen this for a second. So let's see if we can fix this, right? Um, so if I do vault token lookup maybe, and see if it looks up myself. Okay, cool. So I want to see what do we have here? So that was the creation time, creation TTR. Ah, oh, because it's a root token, so it's a little bit different, right? Right, okay, cool. So if I just paste their command in there, I think what they're going to want to do is, we'll just take out the display name because we don't really need that, is we, we don't want it to inherit um, our root token stuff. I don't even know if it would inherit that um, the zero seconds TTR because I think only the root token can do that, to be honest. Um, but so what it should do is it should inherit whatever the default is for the system. And I'm pretty sure it's not one year, right? So uh, we'll just leave everything as is, but then I'm just gonna put um, dash orphan equals true. I think that should work. And I think it should create a token for that. Okay, so let's have a look. So obviously I haven't got this policy here. Uh, if you don't specify a TTL, we we'll use the default TTL in your vault config. Thank you very much. So we specified this TTL here. And what's happened is it has created that. I'm missing something here and I cannot for the life of me remember what it is. Um, so let's have a look. DevOps a deal is coming through. Example Cloud SQL module with the vault integration. Thank you very much, uh, Adil. Um, people check out this link that Adil has just put in the chat. Um, I'll actually check it out after I've finished looking at this question here. Um, so I'm doing something exceeded the maximum. Ah, okay, cool. So basically it's because I've configured my system to have a maximum of 768 hours. I think that's the default, right? Uh, which is what Grateful Cafe was talking about. So essentially, all right, so if I were to uh, let's just change this command now and change this to 30 hours. Now we're getting a token duration of 30 hours. And I'm pretty sure that after 30 hours it will expire and not before and not after that. And the reason why is because it's not inheriting anything from the token that's created this token, right? Um, and obviously, I think like like Grateful Cafe was saying, um, if you don't specify a TTL, it's just going to use the defaults that the the um, that Vault is actually configured with. So I think the key thing there is like when you're creating tokens, if you don't want it to inherit things from the token that's creating that token, you always have to orphan it, right? So just use the orphan equals true flag, and you should be good to go, right? And you can also do stuff like uh, add another flag to take away the default policy if you want. So it can be quite specific to just the policy that you've enabled. Now, obviously, like I say, I haven't created this policy, which is why I get that warning there. But it's fine, you know. Um, I think that kind of solves their problem there. Now, before we move 
on to the next question. I just want to check out this link that Adil has put in the chat. Um, very valid point, actually, before I move on. So please also consider how long that the token really needs to be valued, how it will be used, how long the process that will use the token will run. So this is some of the stuff that your identity and access management function are going to be really interested in, right? Because when they're asking for tokens to be created, they're going to want to know what's the token for, all the questions that Grateful Cafe has just specified in there. So what you're going to want to do is create tokens based on those pieces of information, right? You want to do um, least privilege approach and you want to enable it for the shortest time possible. But at the same time, you don't want it to be too short whereby it runs out before your process is finished running and then you have some kind of issues uh, with your, your processes completing which can cause all kinds of outages, right? So, you know, you really need to understand your processes. You really need to understand the length of time that they're gonna run for and write granular policies so that these tokens can only access the secrets that they are required to access for their function that they need to perform, right? So definitely, definitely good advice there. Thank you very much. I feel like I've got two great mods almost in this chat, you know, between Adil and Grateful Cafe. This is, uh, this is nice, man. Thank you so much. Let's have a quick look at this uh, link that Adil has popped in the chat. So DevOps Adil is the GitHub handle. Everyone go over there and follow DevOps Adil. He's a great guy. I've known him from the London DevOps community for, uh, I don't know, how long has it been Adil? Maybe a year or two or longer? I bumped into you in a few meetups. Yeah, here we've got some example Terraform code that can be found in the Cloud SQL module with Vault integration. So they're creating the uh, the GCP database here. They're creating the, uh, the database instance. Anyone that's not familiar with the way that Cloud SQL does things, you kind of create the database and then you create the instance within that, right? And then you're creating a user for that database. Uh, it was a quick write up just now to show an example of Cloud SQL in integration with Vault. Yeah, it's a good write up because straight away it just makes sense from my experience of using GCP for Cloud SQL. Uh, so yeah, you're just creating a user here with this piece of code. Now you're moving on to Vault, right? So you're, you're mounting uh, the database secrets engine at the uh, Postgres path. So it's gonna be Postgres forward slash creds forward slash whatever your role is if you're gonna read the credentials. Um, then you're creating the backend connections. Now you want to configure uh, how Vault can talk to your Cloud SQL database. So this is the backend that we just created. So it's referencing that. We're calling it Postgres and the allowed roles are dev and prod. And a connection string is literally just interpolating from the resources that we created above here, right? And then we're creating a role. So it's pretty similar to the links that Adil popped in the chat earlier on which is great. And now this is where the magic comes in, right? So this is what you were talking about, Adil. So this is the bit I haven't seen before. So what you're doing is you're creating a, a, a cloud function and it's gonna rotate the root credentials, right? And the runtime is using Python 3 and the event trigger is stack driver. I don't really understand all of this, Adil. Maybe one time you can explain this because I haven't really used cloud functions, right? So there's a trigger here called stack driver. I need to understand exactly what that stack driver trigger is and how it's gonna make this function run. And the entry point is hello get. I'm guessing that you've just kind of maybe just thrown this together just to kind of demonstrate the flow and actually you would have more specific things inside there. Is that right? Vault audit logs in stack driver. Oh, I see the workflow. So you're looking at the audit logs, you're looking for the stack driver and when that happens then this function will run. Thank you. It makes sense. This is good stuff. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, definitely, like I say, follow follow DevOps Adil on GitHub. I'm pretty sure that if you're interested in Vault stuff, you're going to come across a lot of things that he is working on. We have a monthly catch up and he's told me some interesting things, problems that, that he is trying to solve. But let's move on to the next question. Let's see what we have here. So we have a question about Vault on Windows, right? So 
Let's just get this question up. Right. Yeah, it is nice, isn't it? Really, really nice. It's good stuff, Adil. Okay, so please help. Windows operating system, I'm not able to create a role, then configure the role to the secret as provided in the example below, right? So they have this learn guide here, which I'll click on. I received multiple errors similar to the following. Policy underscore ARNS is not recognized as an internal or external command. Ah, okay. I think I know what the problem is, um, but we'll step through this step by step. Let's have a quick look at this learn guide and just see some of the things that it may be telling this person to run. Um, okay, so they're just gonna create the, the secrets engine, that's fine. Just exporting a couple of environment variables. And I think this is where the problem is gonna lie, something like this, right? So. I've got a Windows machine up, right? Um, so the first thing I'll say is they're getting all these error messages because it's not recognizing the commands. Now, the first thing it could be is that when they've downloaded the vault binary, they haven't placed it on their path, right? So if I just hit the start menu and just type in path, uh, I should get this here. So edit the system environment variables. If I click on that and then hit this environment variables button, I'm sorry if the screen is really tiny. I tried to zoom it earlier on and it went crazy. So uh, the point is you just hit and start and you're, you're typing in path and it should bring you to an option where you can edit the system environment variables. You have this system properties box here and at the bottom there's a button that says environment variables. If you click on that, the variable you're looking for is this variable called path. So there's one of two things that you can do here. You can place the binary in this path, right? So if I hit edit, you have the path here. So you can just go to this location and place the binary there. And when you do that, then you should be able to use the vault command. So I've already done that, right? Or if you wanna place it somewhere else, you can add somewhere to your path just by adding a new um, entry to this environment variable just by hitting this new button and then it will pick it up from there, right? So, uh, I'll just come out of that. So that's the first thing, it could be that, right? But assuming that it's not that, because if we go back to the question, uh, what were they saying? They were saying they're getting errors like policy uh, ARNS is not recognized as an internal command, right? And if we look at this, in kind of the Unix world, if we want to run the uh, command over multiple lines, we use this kind of backslash uh, to kind of append to a new line. So it will just kind of see the next line as the same line, right? Now I'm pretty sure in PowerShell, it's going to be something different. I think it's a backtick, right? So this is potentially where they get an issue. So they mentioned policy ARNs. Let's see if I actually see that in any commands maybe. Uh, I don't, but I, I'm gonna bet that that's what it is, right? So if I come here and let me just start a vault server from here, right? Uh, so if I do vault, um, can can you all read the screen? Do you want me to zoom? Let me see if I can zoom this up a little bit more, right? Uh, I'm hoping that's a lot more readable. Um, okay. So if we're just gonna start a vault server, right? I uh, appreciate the follow, thank you very much. Uh, so if we do vault server, uh, and then let's go to a new line. And in PowerShell, you use this backtick button and we'll do dash dev and see if this works as a single command, right? So if I run this, well, let's just select it and run the selection see what happens and it looks like it's working right so that's the trick there if you're following these learn guys i i apologize they are all written with a very unix centric uh kind of viewpoint so if you are using windows that's one thing to bear in mind is anytime where you see these these backslashes um for a command to go into a new line you just need to replace that with a backtick like we have here right and 
that's what works with with PowerShell or Windows in general, right? So that should answer the question. So they, their problem is is either they haven't got the vault binary on their path, so they need to move it to their path, or they need to add the location where the binary is to the path environment variable. Or their second issue could be that they're just not translating the backslashes to backticks for Windows to understand that it is a uh, the same line which is being presented on a new line, right? So that's a pretty straightforward question to answer. I hope that helps that user there, right? Moving on to the next question. Um, we have another one about the Transit Secrets Engine private key. So let's have a look. Sunil001 repo. I don't know why I feel like I know this person. I feel like it's a friend of mine. Okay, cool. So I am very new to HashiCorp Vault and have a few basic questions. So the first one is using the Transit Secrets Engine, is there a way to get private key the way we get the public key? So get Transit Key's name. This is required as we are trying to use our own crypto service, but use Vault only for creating and storing and updating key materials. So the only way to get the private key is to make the key exportable. Um, I'm going to be doing a bit of Googling just to remind myself because I had this challenge when I was a consultant uh, working for a client where we were trying to migrate from uh, one vault to the next. And one of the issues was the keys that were used to encrypt application data. Could we export them and then import them into the new one, right? So I think there's a caveat to it, if I remember correctly. I think if you make a key exportable, that's an irreversible action, right? So, uh, so if I do transit secrets engine export key, uh, let's see if anything jumps out. Okay, it looks like this is that same post that we just clicked on. So if I click on this documentation and see, here we go. So when you're creating a key, one of the parameters you need to pass if you want to be able to make that key exportable is just to set this to true. Do I have any recourse for learning Azure DevOps? I don't at the moment, but I know some people that probably do. Um, so if you, I can ask them after this live stream and see if there's anything that they can point you to. If you follow me on, on Twitter, let me just put my Twitter in here. Um, I'll ask them and I'll tweet it, right? So that's my Twitter there. So just, just hit the follow button um, and then I'll ask them off a live stream. Some people that work for Microsoft and hopefully they can point you in the right direction for that. And I'll pass that information on to you on Twitter. Um, but yeah, sorry, heading back to the question. Uh, so yeah, so all you have to do is make that exportable. Um, and I think so it enables the key to be exportable. This allows for all valid keys in the key ring to be exported. Once set, this cannot be disabled. So that's what I meant. It's, it's a one way uh transaction that uh, you can't reverse it so you know if the security posture of your organization uh is that we shouldn't know what the private keys are and no one should have access to it other than vault then making a key exportable is kind of going to breach your security posture there so you have to be wary of that so in my use case when i was working with my previous client uh, the issue was we'd need to make the keys exportable to bring them into a new um, bring them into a new vault but then once it's kind of exportable that's it like you know you can't make it uh, unexportable again so and that went against the security posture so ultimately we had to like migrate applications to new keys so it was a bit more of a long term onboarding process from the old vault to the new vault uh, my trusted moderator, DevOps Adil has posted a link which seems very relevant to this uh, let's just see what that link is so this is, so basically what I've explained is the first step, right? You need to make the key exportable first, right? Once you've made the key exportable, then this link that my trusted friend DevOps Adil has posted 
is the next thing you would do. Um, so this is the this is the API documentation. So you would just make an API call to this endpoint here with the key type and the name and the version of the key that you want to export because you know you can rotate the keys within the transit secrets engine. So if you've rotated it five times, you might only want to export the fifth version, for example. Uh, so you'd make the API call to this endpoint. You can do this also with the command line uh, interface as well. And you would just have to uh, provide some of these things as part of your payload, right? So you just need to provide the key type as a required parameter within your payload and the name of the key. And it's optional if you want to uh, put what version it is. If you do not set that, it's probably going to be later. Yeah, snap. If the version is set to latest, the current key will be returned. And yeah, here's just an example of the API call that you would make. And that's the response you get. Do we have an example payload? No, we don't. That's a shame. But yeah, it would just be a JSON document, which would just have the key type um, as the key. And then the, the value would be one of these. And then same with the name and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So you can make them exportable, but you know it's irreversible if you do that. So just bear that in mind. And before you go and do something like that, Definitely speak to your um, your security uh, team within your organization and see what their stance is on private keys being exportable and make sure they understand the limitations of doing something like that and if it if it fits in with the security posture. Because there are many organizations where it's, it's perfectly fine for that to happen. It sounded like this user's use case. Again, it's perfectly fine. Um, but you just want to be sure that you're not kind of stepping outside the, the, um, the boundaries that have been set so yeah, uh, moving on, let's just check what the next question is. We have another question about Vault KMS seal with AWS. This one, I actually remember this one now. Um, let's see if I can click this. I remember this because I came across it and I had to go and look at source code and speak to the development teams. I want to give a shout out to Tom Proctor, who is a software engineer on the Vault ecosystem team so tom is the person that i've been speaking to about this but let's just go through the question um so does the vault kms seal support aws config file and aws profile environment variable without providing the aws secret access key and the aws access key id i hope the aws client would assume the iron rule for me before fetching kms key info I already set the AWS config file and the AWS uh, profile thinking that Vault would use the config file for the KMS credentials, but it still requires me to provide the secret access key and the access key ID in the environment variable. So um, unfortunately, I did speak to Tom about this. We had a look at the source code and um, it does not support uh, fetching these details from the AWS config file. That said, under the hood, it's using a lot of the um, the client libraries for AWS, which does support that. So the mechanism itself is there. I just don't think it's actually written into Vault to be able to recognize that environment variable for you. So if that's something that you're interested in, which I can see the value or something like that, uh, because you know clearly you don't really want to be putting uh, the access key and and um, key id in your actual vault config and you know even setting it as environment variables is a little bit funny right if you feel more secure doing it in a config file and that's something you hope it will support in the future please do raise a github issue um let's just see let's just go to vault github go here Okay, so I'll just pop this link in the chat. If you raise a GitHub issue here, um, and just it's a feature request at the end of the day, you want to expand the functionality of that. Um, and let me know about it. I'll pass it on to the product manager and the development teams and see if that's something we can get in a future release. Like I make no promises, but... Um, if you want to write that issue, uh, we would be grateful. If um, you want help writing that issue, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, again, I'll post my Twitter 
on here just so that you can contact me. So just follow me on Twitter uh, and then send me a message on Twitter if you need help writing an issue and I can work with you to get that in there. Um, and yeah, I'll just kind of show you while we're here. Uh, I think we have some templates now. So if you create a new issue, there are a few different things you could do. So you can have bug reports, so you would start there. In this case, it's gonna be a feature request. Um, you also have, if you have written a Vault plugin, this is a, a new one to me and I really like this. If you've written a Vault plugin and you would like it to be added to uh, the plugins that come out of the box with Vault, uh, you can submit that right here. You can also um, view information about how to responsibly disclose any security vulnerabilities that you may come across with Vault. Uh, I'm not aware of any myself, but you know, if you do come across one, you know, please responsibly uh, disclose that to us just by viewing our policy and following the steps in there. And ultimately, if you want to ask a question, you can hit this open button, which will take you to our community forum, which is where I'm answering the questions from right now. Uh, so yeah, I'll just quickly show you while we're here what the uh, template looks like for a feature request. And there's just a few questions that you have to answer and just kind of give some details. So is your feature request related to a problem? Please describe. Um, thank you so much, Adila. You, you know what? I'm t you're doing a much better job at marketing than I am, and it's my own module. Thank you so much. You probably noticed it when I was looking for the database module as well, and you're thinking, how come he's not mentioned that? Very good point. But yeah, we just have this template here. So just answer these questions and um, just submit the issue. If if you submit the issue uh, and you want to let me know about it, uh, just like I say, just ping me. Maybe I can retweet it and try and get some conversation around it in the AWS community that are using Vault, which would always help because we try and get thumbs up on these issues so that our uh, product managers know what uh, issues are most important to our practitioners out there. So yeah, that's how you can do it. And like I say, I'm always happy to work with the community to do these things here. So that about wraps up our brown bag session. Uh, we've been going for two minutes shy of an hour. I really appreciate all the engagement uh, from the chat. Uh, DevOps Adil, um, you've been an absolute legend. Thank you so much. Grateful Cafe as well. You've been really, really useful contributing to the conversation. Just a reminder, if you would like to have your questions answered on the live stream, just head over to, I'll just pop it in the chat. So it's discuss.hashicorp.com. And then you can answer your question in there under the relevant um, product that you're answering the question about. So if it's Vault, it would be Vault. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm doing Vault brown bag sessions. I may in the future expand it to other tools and products. Um, but yeah, just make sure that you ask the questions in there. If you want to kind of reach out to me once you've asked the question, ping me a link to that on Twitter, do so. I can't promise that I'll definitely get to that question on a live stream, but you know, it's just the best way to go. Ask it on there. The community will try to answer and ultimately I will try to answer on a live stream if possible. So of that, I would like to thank you all very, very much. And I will catch you next week, Tuesday with another Vault Brown Bag session. Have a great week and peace out.